So this is uh, Phi Psi 134. Uh, the, the class is called uh, Global Warming, Understanding the Forecast. And the goal of the class, what we would like for you to get a glimpse of, is uh, how, the, how, how stuff works that determines the climate of the Earth. You can read lots of books that talk about you know, all the dire predictions of, of climate change, uh, but it's hard to know, it's hard for people outside the field to know uh, you know exactly how to how much to how much how, how much to believe that stuff right and so the goal of this class is to explain to you kind of from first principles as much as possible how how the climate of the earth is determined uh, energy comes in from 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 the sun and and then it sort of hangs out on earth for a while till it leaves again so the earth is like a you know, there's a river and there's some pool off to the side and water flows in and then flows back out again. It's like a backwater. Um, so we'll sort of understand how that works. You know, what energy is exactly and what is heat and, and how does it travel through a vacuum. So if you have a thermos bottle to keep your coffee hot, the best kind of a thermos bottle would have a vacuum in between your, your, your hot coffee and the outside wall because that's the best insulator there is. So there's 93 million miles of the best insulator there is between us and the sun. So how do we get energy to go through that? And then um, there are some gases. Most of the gases in the atmosphere are not greenhouse gases, but there are some gases that interact with the way energy leaves the planet in the form of infrared light. And so we'll learn why some gases are greenhouse gases and why others aren't, you know, about the, the molecular structure of the gases and how it interacts with the wave of electrical energy that, that, that is light. So to try to understand, you know, the ideas behind, behind the, uh, the, 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 the forecast for climate change. Um, the, we will, um, after about half of the class, half of the class will be sort of climate physics and how, how the climate of the earth works. And then we'll take a break from that and talk about carbon. So carbon is this astonishing element. I mean, no one would have imagined that carbon would be able to form living, living creatures, right? I mean, the natural tendency in, 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 according to the second law of thermodynamics is for stuff to fall apart. That's basically what the second law of thermodynamics says. Let's see, I think, let's do our, our uh, seat finder thing again. Any empty seats, any place? There's, there's uh, two down here. <laughs> Your comfort is our goal here. Uh, and, and yet life somehow seems to be able to defy the second law of thermodynamics and create, uh, to create this amazing order in, in, living, in living creatures. Uh, and it also, there's, it has a similar sort of touch of magic almost when you think about the earth as a whole. The, 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 the biosphere of the Earth is incredibly complicated, with you know trees that, that, that take up oxygen and or take up CO2 and release oxygen, and animals that breathe oxygen and eat the trees, and uh, and and cycles of of nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. It's a very complicated thing, but yet there seems to be this sort of intrinsic stability that the biosphere uh, has achieved, uh, that that keeps the climate and the chemistry of the Earth stable on geologic time scales. So uh, the, there's this paradox that Carl Sagan originally named called the faint young sun paradox, which is that stars as they age just naturally get brighter because you, you make heavier atoms out of the lighter ones and so they collapse and so the gravitational energy that drives the nuclear fusion reaction gets a little bit more intense. The fires burn more strongly as, as, as the stars age. So uh, back at the beginning of the Earth, the history of the Earth, there was, uh, the, the sun was 25% was colder than it is today. So how is it that the Earth's temperature has stayed within fairly narrow temperature limits throughout the entire time of, 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 of Earth history? Uh, and then there's another sort of a, 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 an amazing mystery which has to do with oxygen in the atmosphere which is there entirely because of photosynthesis. Plants put it there. If this was a dead planet, 
it would have an atmosphere like Mars perhaps. Uh, there'd be more CO2 and there'd be no oxygen in it. The oxygen is there because the trees put it there, but it's not obvious why the oxygen concentration of the air isn't 10 times higher than it is today or 10 times lower. But we know that over half a billion years of Earth history, the oxygen concentration has been sort of within narrow ranges. If it ever did get 10 times higher, one spark of lightning and a whole continent would burn down. Or if it was 10 times lower, you know, all of us multicellular types would sort of drop out of the picture because we wouldn't be able to hang on. So uh, the carbon cycle is an astonishing thing. And we'll sort of spend a few weeks talking about that, about how, how the carbon cycle of the Earth works. And now we've set the stage to, uh, to, to monkey around with the system by taking carbon out of the Earth and putting it into the air, which is what you know, fossil fuel combustion is doing. So we can think about how the carbon cycle you know, will respond to that and how the climate of the Earth will respond to that. And you know, by the end of the quarter, we'll have talked about uh, what the forecast for climate change says and what uh, the impacts of that would be and what it would take to avoid this, because we'll think a little bit about where our energy comes from and, and, and what the alternatives are. So that's kind of the, the, the overarching you know, scope of the class. Uh, the class is entirely, the lectures are based on uh, a textbook which I wrote for and from the class uh, a couple of years ago called Global Warming Understanding the Forecast. And this is the only time I've ever taught a class where I can actually follow the textbook. You know, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. Whenever I use someone else's textbook, you know, it's always in the wrong order. I can't do it. I sort of do it my own way. And so the textbook is kind of, you know, might be useful, but, but maybe not sort of a reference book. But in this case, we actually go through the text from the beginning to the end. And it takes about two lectures to get through one of the chapters. So there's actually a calendar for the lectures, what we're going to cover. Uh, each, each time that's on the syllabus, which is on the chalk site, which you all can, can, can download and look at. Uh, there are two supplementary books which I would like you to read. Because we're talking mostly about sort of the, the, the ropes and pulleys of how the system, the climate system works, we, we sort of do short shrift to you know, all the dire predictions and, 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 and what can be done, the sort of more, you know, briefing kind of uh, presentation of the issue. So there are these two books that I want you to read uh, through the course of the quarter that kind of fill out that, 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 th th those ideas. So the first one is called uh, Six Degrees, Our Future on a Hotter Planet by a journalist named Mark Linus. And he's written a couple of climate change books. And they're pretty good. This one has got uh, six chapters in it one for each degree centigrade of warming of the Earth. It's a very clever idea. And he spent you know, uh, a long time with a big shovel in the library going through all of the climate impact literature and coming up with you know, cool, scary stuff to tell you about rainforests that turn into deserts and, and, and cool stuff like that. And he arranges it all in, uh, in, in these chapters according to where, you know, what, what degree of warming it is thought might, might trigger those things. So uh, I would like for you to uh, read that one by the time of the midterm, which is halfway through the class. And uh, we'll talk about it before the midterm. And there will be a question or two on the midterm, not to gauge you know, whether you've memorized everything in it, but just to kind of, for those of you who have read it, you know, awake, but in a casual sort of way, you should be able to get the question right and, and get credit for you know, the time you spent doing that. So you know, the textbook you need to study, this, these two books you just sort of need to, to read. I'm giving them a chance at bat. You know, and if you'll, you go for it, that's cool. And if, you, you know, if it doesn't speak to you so much, just read it to the point where you sort of know what's going on. And then you'll be able to do fine on, on that question on the exam. So these are definitely supplemental books. And then the second one. I would have you read by the time of the final. This is ideas about how, uh, how to, it's called what they call mitigation, how you avoid, what changes can be made to how we do business that could avoid climate change. It's, uh, it's Hot, Flat, and Crowded by Thomas Friedman. He's a columnist for the New York Times. 
uh, I heard that Northwestern University is requiring every entering undergraduate uh, you know, freshman this year to read this book. And I also read that it's on, it was on Obama's uh, 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 summer vacation reading list. So, and it's a great book. I mean, the guy has, has a, a, a real vision about what, you know, how, how climate constraints kind of fit into globalization and economics and energy and, and all that sort of stuff. He thinks that, uh, well, you know, we'll talk about what, what, what he thinks. But uh, so then there will be a question or two on the final exam about that one. Again, you don't have to study it but just kind of read it and stay awake while you're reading it and you should do fine on that, on that, on that question.